Good morning, everybody. It's your favorite Spiring Revolution. You're here, a wandering author, reminding you that we are all the authors of our own lives. Today, I am standing just outside of Canyon City, uh, Colorado, um, and we're going to pick up with the Roman Empire. As you remember last time, uh, we spoke about the, the Roman Republic's downfall, which ended with Mark Antony and Octavian having a civil war. And so... <coughs> And this marks the entry into a new phase of human history and, uh, you know, the transition between a republic in Rome and imperial Rome. So Caesar and Pompey's civil war showed us how authoritas, uh, Latin for authority, had been transferred from republican instruments like the Senate invested into military strongmen. Following Caesar's ascension, peace was short-lived. <coughs> he famously remarked, et tu, Brute, when a group of friendly conspirators stabbed him to death on the Senate floor. After a few short years, after all, a few short years was all it took to plunge the newfound empire into civil war once again. This time it will be Octavian and Mark Antony battling it out for supremacy, who happened to be two of the people that conspired against Caesar. Um, uh, by sheer happenstance, a uh, god was born in the form of a human baby around this time, somewhere on the imperial fringes in the uh, city of Bethlehem. These two forces set the stage for the Principate, Rome's earliest phase of empire. Now, unbeknownst to the newly crowned emperor, uh, this manger-born baby in Bethlehem is going to go on and found a religion that outlasts the empire itself. <laughs> sudden profound changes marked the dividing point between the Republican Empire, the Old and New Testament, and these two distinct phases in the history of man. Now looking more closely at the empire, we could see a picture that is eerily reminiscent of today. An ineffectual senate based mostly on facade rather than tradition, a growing chasm between those who ruled society and those who lived in it, Periods of marked civil unrest, rampant inflation, and generalized social tension. <clears throat> Sounds familiar. You know, now after Octavian emerged victorious from the civil war against Mark Antony, he returned home to Rome amidst popular acclaim in 30 BC. Uh, and he promised the people that he was going to bring an end to war and a new era of peace and prosperity. Behind the scenes, though, Octavian's power rested on a constitutional anomaly. There was no real basis for it. And so he quickly began to coalesce uh, his followers and consolidate the spoils of empire. However, unlike some of his predecessors, you know, Sola um, and even Caesar, uh, th there was no pogrom. Uh, they didn't hunt down. He didn't hunt down his rivals. Uh, he would actually refrain from doing that. <laughs> And the Senate gave him, or bestowed on him, the title of princeps, which is Latin for leading man, a term with no real significance at the time, but it is how we remember this phase of imperial history, the Principate. Now, Octavian would go on and become the emperor's first Augustus a few short years later, I believe in 27 BC, uh, shortly followed by his ascension, he actually rejects the consular um, authority, which is kind of like their president, and becomes the tribune of the plebs, which is uh, kind of loosely translated as champion of the people. Now, posturing as a tribune made it a lot easier for him to appeal to the people and to convince them he was on their side. So, and then another part of his inheritance as the emperor was the Roman army itself. And soldiers soon begin to swear an oath of personal allegiance to him rather than to the republic or the state. Uh, you know, things had changed. A true military dictator was now at the helm and had all political power in the Imperium. So one interesting thing to know about note about this moment is how there is both a centralization of power and simultaneously a decentralization of it. So, you know, as Octavian is acquiring all the formal instruments of power from like the senatorial people, he's having to get people to uh, help him from the equites class. Uh, the civil wars had thinned out the senatorial ranks and you know, for he, Octavian to effectively administer his empire, he had to rely on talent from across the realm. 
um, he opened up the jury to courts and or the jury courts to the Equites, the old nobility, and uh, you know by by 13 BC the senatorial order had been whittled down to only 600 from several thousand, and flesh bread was needed to fill the range. So, you know, obviously, all of this uh, changed things dramatically for the freeborn poor of the empire. And next time we talk, we're going to take a look at how all of these administrative and military changes impacted even the lowliest. Octavian's achievements today are widely remembered. Uh, he built the empire to what we remember it as today, expanding the Romans' borders to, like, their furthest point. And, uh, you know, he's famously remembered for saying that he found Rome as a city of stone and left it as one of marble. We can, much, we can learn a lot about our own times by looking at all of this, because uh, we know that the Western Roman Empire only lasts a few hundred years after this, even though back then it looked like it was at the height of power at this point in time. You know, the, the dangers of centralized power, the perils of unchecked inflation, and even the power of faith, and I aim to explore it. So... <laughs> What are you guys doing in order to inspire, uplift, and empower your local community today? Because this world isn't changing unless we all do our part, and you can count on me daily. Until next time, this is a wandering author reminding you that we are all the, uh, the authors for our own lives. God bless.